Yes, Elaine. I'm going to give people a few more minutes to, um, do you straggle in on Zoom? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, our so Kim, will you, You'll be with us all throughout, right? Or are you going to, you're going what? to be with us for the whole evening, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. <sighs> I only read the first two chapters of the two chapters of Saket's so book. I have to read the whole okay. thing. <gasps> but okay. the I have to get a copy of it because it's in the old days, something like this, we would just send it through Amazon to different people, but it's more complicated these days with oh there's Oh yeah, you've got Robert, the copy. You must have Robert, you look like you're showing us a mirror. Oh no, there it is. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't have a copy with me, but I guess I should. Maybe I should go and sit with one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, right I'll just there. keep holding it up. Probably. <laughs> but I'm glad it uh, reached. I mean, um, I don't know if um, um, uh, it has reached any of the attendees, but yeah. Mm. It's, um, so you read this when? When you were in GNIS? Oh, no, no, obviously it wasn't um, out then. No, I read it uh, maybe. A half a year ago or so, um, okay. when you know, when we were sort of thinking about speakers that it would be great to invite, um, and you know, I've sort of read your novels, but also, but also this, and you know. yeah, you've been working on that. You have the book on Rushdi, so you sort of know the terrain. Yeah, right. Yeah, you should get Norbert to work as your agent. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm um, very. Um, I think you're in good hands with is it what's their name? Uh, uh, permanent press, right? Those are the folks. Oh yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. He he was he passed away recently, actually. Um, the oh, he did. Yeah. Book now, but yeah, no, they're they're good. Yeah. No, we have a lot to talk about. I think when it comes to um, that, that would be a whole other conversation because. Yeah. <laughs> 18th century and British lit is um, obviously very interesting from all perspectives. Yeah. Whether it's yeah. colonial or education, it's a very key period. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm sure you I mentioned you know Gill's work as well. So this mm -hmm. whole sort of yeah. early European visitors is a very yeah. interesting. Yeah, Tim, do you remember that book, The First Ferengis? Yeah. Um, that's so there's a colleague of Saikat's. Yeah, he did Ashoka. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he's actually the current head of the English department and mm. Gil Harris. Mm. So Gil and Madhvi Menon, um, they moved also from the US. Mm -hmm. so, mm. All right. So are we- um, 7.03 for me where I am and what time is it for you now? 7.33 in the morning? Is that cut? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think, let me just check. Yeah, it's right around 7.34, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to get started here. I want to welcome everybody uh, for another one of our um, Yadnan and Center Zoom affairs. And one of our advantages of the Zoom era is that we can actually have speakers speaking to us directly from India. Um, and we appreciate that Saikat is here with us so early in the morning for him and at a reasonable hour um, for us. So again, my name is Tim Kern. I'm the director of the Yad Nanan Center for Indian Studies here at Cal State Long Beach. And I'm actually in the College of Education where I uh, direct the uh, secondary education program. I'm just gonna make a couple of quick announcements and then uh, we'll move on to our program. Uh, our next event is in two weeks time. Uh, Amanda Lucia is from UC Riverside is going to be speaking um, on some of her new research and from her recent book on the global circulation, circulation of Indian festivals. Um, I think that's gonna be a very interesting talk. And then on the 15th of April, we have the uh, uh, Solanke lecture, which this year again will, was postponed because of COVID with Anand uh, Girard-Hardas, um, the very provocative uh, 
just public intellectual. See if you watch MSNBC, you'll see him all the time. Um, and that will be on the 15th of uh, April. And I'm sure he has lots of things to say. He had lots of really interesting things to say when we were setting this up last April. And given what's happened in the last year, I think he has probably lots of other interesting and provocative things to say. So um, please keep a, an eye out for that. So I am going to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Praveena Cooper, who's going to introduce our speaker. And then Norbert Schur from the English department is going to sort of start a conversation with Saikat. And Saikat, I just thank you for coming. Or if, if one, yeah, in Zoom, thank you for turning on your computer with us today. <laughs> and uh, this should be a really interesting talk because I think there's a lot of things of interest in comparison about what's happening in the United States and in India in terms of higher education. So Praveena. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Praveena Cooper from the Department of Comparative World Literature, and I'm totally delighted to welcome Professor Saikat, Professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. Um, he was an erstwhile Californian, so we're kind of claiming him as one of our own. Uh, he's taught at Stanford and has been named a fellow at the Humanities Center at Wellesley College. He's the author of three novels, two of which I finished in this last week. Uh, one is Silverfish, 2007. Uh, the second one is The Scent of God, 2019, which is a story about a young student who dreams of being a monk, but is drawn to another student in a same-sex relationship. The Firebird, now known as The Playhouse in the United States, it's a story of a young boy, Ori, who becomes fascinated and drawn to the world of theater in Calcutta. Both novels, particularly the last two, contain many of the themes that preoccupy Saikat, tradition and modernity, cultural and regional axes as they mingle with colonial foundations. Both novels are also about education, our theme for today, uh, the Bildungsroman, and um, his novels are incredibly sensuous, rich, and very evocative of place and time. They're saturated, they're steeped in the sights and sounds of Bengal in particular. Saikat's book on literary criticism, I thought was an amazing book, uh, Prose of the World. It's a rigorous piece of work in which he argues for a kind of post-colonial literature, which would focus on the ordinary and the banal instead of on the spectacular, dramatic, or as we always know post-colonial as protest literature. He offers James Joyce's Ulysses and Nirat Chaudhary as examples. He feels that by restoring literature to its everyday experience, literature can work as a subaltern historiography and can move more authentically push back on the colonial experience. He's also edited an anthology called The Critic as Amateur, in which he argues for the value of amateurism. Um, which brings us to today's wonderful book by this extremely prolific writer uh, on higher education. The title of the book that we're going to discuss today is College Pathways of Possibility, which my colleague, uh, Professor Norbert Schurer will be discussing with him. Just on a personal note, uh, what has always struck me about Saikat is how he embodies uh, this spaciousness, both in his person and in his professional interests. He's very mindful of the world outside, whether it's caste politics or equality in education, inequity, importance of North versus South, uh, regional axes of literature, knowledge, he writes frequently for columns uh, for non-academic magazines to try and connect it to a general public as a way of embodying this boundary crossing, which is going to be the theme of today's talk, I imagine, boundary, cro boundary crossing of disciplines that he so fiercely advocates and uh, which we will, as I said, hear today. So please join me in welcoming Sekhat Majumdar. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for having me. Um, really, and especially thanks to Praveena, Norbert, Tim, and everybody at the Yadanandan Center. And thank you, Praveena, for that incredibly generous introduction. I'm, I'm very happy that you linked uh, today's talk with uh, my novels, because in some ways, education, you're absolutely right, is a running theme. Um, and um, so what I will do today is um, 
I know um, Norbert told me to keep my uh, opening talk fairly brief. I'll only speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then I think we'll mostly have an interaction, which would be probably more interesting. Um, and um, what I, I think it's um, it's interesting that, um, you know, I mean, we are obviously literally at opposite sides of the world right now. It's 7.30, a little past 7.30 here. But it's also true that in many ways, I think India and the US are perfectly complementary and kind of opposite sides in the education scenario. And I say this because I, my own graduate training, my master's and PhD was in the US. And then I taught in Canada for a couple of years and in the US, in California actually for several years. And I go back and forth. So I, I have seen um, the sort of both sides in a way as an observer. And um, I think I'll just start with, I think the two main factors which make the American and the Indian side very different are uh, basically um, the birth rate um, of college students and the kind of college age students, you know, and, you know, here, you know, we are in a liberal arts environment. So we kind of see the whole teaching uh, situation very interestingly. Uh, and the other thing is the cost of tuition. I think I've been following all these, um, um, you know, um, talks about um, what is the higher education scenario and one piece of research I have come across is that there's a issue with the birth rate. And I, I believe I read somewhere that around 2025 in the US, they're, they're expecting a certain plateauing of sort of the birth rate of college age students. Uh, and I think I was just talking before the talk started with uh, the Cal State perspective, which is a very different, can, can, can be a very different spin on this because it's the the, the population that, they, that that are being trained here are a very different population as opposed to the research universities, which are sort of teaching in the, um, you know, trying to push uh, people in the higher education sector, which is very much in trouble. Now in India, I think the situation is many way kind of a complete reverse. Um, and obviously, as I'm, I, I suppose most of you know, there's a very large illiterate population in India, but at the same time, there is a very large rising youth population. There is an expanding middle class. I suppose the expanse has taken a bit of a hit in um, you know, this pandemic and all the economic uncertainties. But the irony is that in India, even a small percentage can easily run to tens of millions. So you know, I believe I'm, I don't have a great head for uh, data, but I believe the what is considered the middle class in India by Indian standards, which is a little different from the middle class in the U North American standard, um, is probably larger than the entire population of the US. Um, so, um, and there's also a very problematic government, you know, about, you might have followed in the news. Um, but the point is there's a very large constituency for higher education. There's an increasing and it's going to keep rising. You know, that's, that's the real difference. And the other, you know, um, Big differences, um, the higher education in the India has been very low cost. The tuition has been subsidized and this has been kind of the great, um, one of the great happy things about a socialized system where they've managed to keep education very socialized, which is where, you know, the place where I teach Ashoka is kind of a new departure. It's a, it's a private university and um, it's one of the new private universities, kind of the new age liberal arts education institutions. Uh, it is um, it is expensive by Indian standards, but really very inexpensive by um, by American standards. So a lot of people who who might be sending their students abroad, I think currently the tuition works out to around thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars a year. So it's actually very attractive for people who are considering sort of sending their students abroad. So I think I know, but at the same time, there are uh, the quality is quite problematic. So what I'm trying to say here is that the situations that we have here are almost completely reverse. And uh, what I guess it creates is all kinds of possibilities of collaboration and exchange. And that is a subject of a larger, much longer conversations. I don't want that, 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 that takes much longer time. I don't want to necessarily go into that. What I'll do today is just sort of lay out before you a few salient features of the Indian education system where we're coming from some of um, the first, uh, the most sort of striking thing about um, the Indian higher education system is its colonial past. 
So this is something I've said, those of you had a chance to read um, my book college, I've laid this out very early, that essentially we have what I call a clerical past. And education just like Andre Bete has already said that uh, when the British set up uh, the modern university in India, you know, which and 1857 is that defining date here, because that was the year when the three presidencies, Bombay, Madras and Calcutta got their universities. 1857 is better remembered as the time of the Sikhoi mutiny or the great Indian first war of independence. But it's also the year when obviously after the defeat, the rule passed over to the crown and they set up these universities. And the British's goal in setting universities in India was very clear. They really wanted this to staff the imperial service. They really wanted to create a set of clerks, officers, who really populate the uh, this service so that they can essentially rule the country. Obviously, they couldn't do it all on their own. Um, and so there was no lofty goals of research, you know, teaching. It was, you know, the what is the easiest way to certify tens of thousands of people to qualify that you are now qualified to be a bureaucrat or a clerk? Exams. So exams became like a default system. It's a very exam oriented system, very much a rote learning system because that generates the stamp the most quickly. And there was also, I know, um, obviously some racism involved about this is wonderful book um, um, by I think a JNU, Jahalal Nehru University faculty called Deepak Kumar called Science in the Raj, where there were assumptions about whether Indians were really capable of doing scientific research. There were things said that about uh, tropical climate is not conducive conducive for so there was all kinds of reasons why um you know it was a very basically in the 19th century uh, the two major models of uh, education that were available to the western world um what is one of the, of course the german university model the humboldt's model of the research university um you know the free uh, the university of berlin and what is called the pastoral care model, which is, um, you know, in many ways, the Oxbridge model, where you have a small college and you kind of take care of them. Um, you know, and um, uh, I, I think the education historian David Larrabee has done very interesting research on this, that, you know, the two, uh, these are the two models, the <coughs> German model and the uh, pastoral model. And he talks about the American University, how it added a third dimension, the community engagement. And I remember Clark Kerr's wonderful uh, comment that um, the British undergraduate college, the German Research University, and the American Land Grant College, they came together to kind of make up the history of the American University. So none of these were in play, you know, in the Indian scenario, none of these. So in what was happening in Europe was completely different. The goals of the British government were very bureaucratic, very clerical. And the vision for anyone who un wants to understand the Indian, Indian University, you need to you need to get a sense that this is where they're coming from. This is kind of where the Indian University and the history is coming from. And, um, you know, which is why I think, again, the new uh, private universities with interdisciplinary liberal, liberal arts curriculum are often very confusing uh, to a lot of Indians because, um, you know, they don't understand its admission criteria. It's not necessarily based on grades or marks. It is very much like an American university. Um, so um, um, so what I, what I call the result of this, this kind of a history is what I say uh, is that the Indian University is based on a consumption model. And by that, I mean, uh, they really about, they really test the students as well as how well they consume knowledge, how well they learn. And, you know, and this, not only the university, it also sort of filters into the, um, into the, K-12 secondary education, I have two small children in, in, in junior school and I see this directly firsthand that the central board, for, it's really about memorizing things and kind of sort of spewing it on the right way. And, um, and the reason is also very clear because right from the 19th century in India, research and teaching were completely binarized. They were, they were completely different directions. So there were institutes like the Asiatic Society and other research centers that were set up. And even today, there are a number of excellent research centers you know, going for the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research to the Indian Institute of Sciences, you know, to Indian, uh, you know, a lot of these 
mostly in the sciences, natural and the social sciences, but they have almost no connection with undergraduate teaching. So clearly the conception is a college is a place where people go to learn and kind of get existing knowledge and sort of just spew it out and how well you learn it is tested in the exams and a research center is totally different. So there's completely no connection. So the model that, um, you know, that um, became popular in the US through the Johns Hopkins University, the research university model, which tries to bring the two together um, is not really understood. It's not really there. Um, you know, there are some, some exceptions, but on the whole, it's really not there. Um, and this sort of becomes clear in both faculty interest the faculty are also not really um, focused on research, and uh, um, and the students, um, you know, students are also um, very much exam driven. And I think I want to say that you know this works. This doesn't work badly. This does work to a degree. This actually works in the good colleges, in the which again are very metropolitan in their location, especially with the good teachers. Like for instance, I went to St. Xavier's College in Calcutta and I received what in English would be a very good formalist new critical model of training, you know, which is what you get often when there isn't a wrong, strong research faculty. And the reason behind it is there's a very strong middle class emphasis on education. There's a very, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's a, education is a key value. And uh, you have a K-12 system, which is, um, you know, which is, um, um, which is very stodgy, but fairly academic. I mean, obviously the culture is very different from the US high schools where, I mean, in India, in Indian schools, it's actually cool to be a nerd, you know, you don't, it's kind of funny because, you know, the sports people are there, but actually the cool ones are actually the nerds. So that culture is very much there and math and science at top of the food chain. And um, that kind of works well. Uh, and I think this um, happens well, this works well till college. Uh, but after that, what I feel is the quality starts to fall off. And this is because, you know, uh, as I say also in my book, College, that you can't, you, they have binarized the research and teaching so clearly, the consumption and learning that till MA, almost there's no research. And then suddenly you can't wake up one fine morning at the PhD and start doing research. So what with the trend we have seen is most India, a lot of Indian students leave the Indian higher education after college they go abroad which is what even i did also because funding is available but um but their their the research culture is not not strong and there are some interesting example exceptions one is um, you know with what with both tim and norbert here i think it's interesting to talk about this that history is a really important ex exception history is a field where there's been a lot of interesting research you know kind of produced in india South Asian history is actually a very important field where there's a great work coming out. And I think in some ways, history and English offer a mock study in contrasts. History is, even though he's been very exciting from a research perspective, somehow history doesn't gen seem to generate a lot of pedagogic excitement in the classroom. It doesn't seem to be very popular. English almost offers a complete study of complete reverse situation where there's a great tradition of English teachers. There's this whole charismatic English teacher kind of a personality going back to even in Calcutta alone, Henry Lee Rosio to all the te great teachers of Shakespeare, a bit, bit like a dead poet society, sort of an excited glamour around the English teacher and English classes are thronged. English, as I was just talking, is a very popular subject partly because of its colonial heritage. But on the other hand, it hasn't really created any significant research apparatus, which is very interesting how these things kind of work out. And um, the problem is on the whole, because uh, in even the Indian institutes you might have heard about like the IITs and all, they're really known for their excellent students. And in India, again, you know, for one seat, 10,000 students compete. So statistically alone, you're going to end up with a student who's actually pretty good. But the, but the research coming out from the faculty is not necessarily comparable to the high standards uh, around the world. So I, I, say, I, I have what I feel is that poor research culture has created university teachers who are not necessarily at their best. Um, and I and, and, and I've written about this quite a bit, and I've also suggested that a fundamental change um, in introducing research earlier on from college 
you know, I know in American, in the American system, it starts as early as the last days of high school, where you, and this, this is something that is very important. And, and at Ashoka, um, which is, as some of you know, is a interdisciplinary liberal arts model university. Um, often we have done away with exams, you know, the evaluation system is completely left to the instructors. And often in my classes, I will not have an exam, but assign a paper. And this is actually quite radical for the Indian education system, where they still have a very centralized model model of education. Um, so uh, I think, um, but on the other hand, as I said, this knowledge of consumption of canonical knowledge works, doesn't work, uh, works fairly well. Um, you know, and uh, Indian students uh, who study, who do their bachelors, uh, or sometimes even masters in India and go say to the US do fairly well. Um, because I, I'm thinking of my own position, what happened, I I was I was thrown into a classroom. I was I was a TA, and I was asked to teach MLA documentation, which I'd never done. I'd never done MLA documentation. I I just didn't have those research skills. But on the other hand, I had a very good knowledge of the canon. I had a very good knowledge of the canon of literary studies. I mean, and I found that my peers might have taken this excellent class on. 19th century public sanitation in you know in literature, but they may not necessarily always know the difference between Augustine and Romantic poetry. Whereas in in India we had a very solid um, literary historical model of canonical study, which sort of left almost no gaps in the canon, and um, so um, and I found it was easier actually to do research with that model, and so. We knew enough, we, we had consumed a lot of knowledge, but we were never encouraged to produce knowledge. We were never encouraged to sort of critically think. And even those of us who had an abiding interest in doing that kind of stuff, we were not given the platform. But that is something, you know, we, we build up. And, um, you know, I think there are many new directions. I don't want to, um, you know, talk too much about this in case you have questions. There are many new directions that are happening. I mean, of course, one is, what we call, um, what I've been talking about is the interdisciplinary liberal arts model. Uh, and this is often very confusing to Indians because they, uh, liberal arts as a very American concept is not really understood in India. They think it's humanities or performing arts. They often confuse it. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, and I've written quite a bit about this on public forums, that it's really not about any subject, but a certain approach to education, which synthesizes you know, even disparate subjects. And as, um, you know, Praveena mentioned in my work, I even talk about what I saw when I was at Stanford, sort of bringing computer science together with music or literature. So this approach is not understood. Uh, but at the same time, I think, and this is true of not just India, but much of Asia on the whole, there's a sense of tiredness, there's a sense of exhaustion with the same kind of technocratic education. There's the same kind and because it is mushroomed so widely and there's so many third and fourth rate engineering colleges that there's a sense that this is not the best kind of employees that we can create. They lack communication skills, they lack interpersonal skills. So this is the sort of this exhaustion out of which you know a lot of these private universities are created by very successful entrepreneurs who themselves have engineering backgrounds, who themselves have backgrounds in finance and investment. And I think what has happened in the 21st century is that because of a globalized and digitized economy, there are so many more options. I know even our English, English majors are, have so many different careers in publishing, media, including television, or in many other nonprofit options. And I still think that greatest strength of this university system is still low tuition. This is, I think, a big marker. I, I think many of the concerns um, in the West are coming out that it's very hard to contain an university at a sort of manageable rate, but it still continues to be fairly low. Even Ashoka, uh, which is considered, as I said, expensive, uh, most students still graduate without a debt, without a debt or a kind of an outstanding loan, which I think in turn frees them up to experiment with their education. They are not under obligation to choose the most immediately rewarding. Um, of course, the biggest challenge is to democratize this model of education in a country which is so vast and so staggeringly divided in terms of opportunities. Um, you know, um, and um, 
it's also you know worth seeing whether it can at all be fully democratized or the model will kind of remain small and um you know um and um uh because the problem is also that um, again those of you who follow news we have a fairly hostile government a fairly intolerant government which is fairly um right leaning and there's a kind of a hindu majority rule and they have been in many ways anti liberal you know the whole idea of the liberal arts which entails a certain kind of free thought free criticism has been very anathemical to this government and a lot of student protests have been crushed so there's been that concern we are still protected because we are in a kind of a private oasis and you're not financially dependent on them but the general climate is quite difficult and this is the government which has finally come up with a new education policy which again those of you who follow the education news um you know in india will know and um and there are a lot of things that there are certain things about the education policy i have been enthusiastic about they have talked about the national research foundation the most interesting thing is they are talking about um a more interdisciplinary liberal arts model they i think they've also realized and i was in consultation with some of the members of the um of the nep committee of the liberal arts um system that um that um move away from because in india traditionally you just entered college declaring a major right away you studied english you studied history you studied physics that's all you studied you pretty much and you took a couple of other subjects but that was more perfunctory but there was no question of range which is the liberal arts um element uh, and one of the more um, striking elements the new education policy suggests is what they call the multi year exits that you can leave college at the end of first year and you'll get a certificate you leave college at the end of second year you get a diploma you leave college at the end of three years you get a bachelor's and you leave college at the end of four years you get a bachelor's degree with a research component and this i think is something that we are kind of very hotly debating right now what this means and the biggest worry is that students will decide um you know when they want to leave depending on their financial situation clearly even if they get given scholarships the students who need to get jobs quickly will leave early so there are that's something we are concerned about but that is that is a directive that is kind of given to us so i think right now we are at a moment of crossroads with a new education policy just being enacted and at the same time the country also showing a certain ambivalence at least the middle class certainly you know opening up to other possibilities but at the same time are having a government which is kind of intolerant so i think it's a very exciting at a very uncertain time and i understand you know in the us also you're facing a similarly uncertain time so i mean i'll i'll just stop here today and because i think um there are so many um you know so many points of comparison and who knows what might emerge out of this i mean those of us who are you know working in this mode and i i very much see myself i mean though i'm primarily my primary work is in literature you know as a writer i've been very concerned with this educational public sphere and i've been very involved in writing um for as many platforms as possible because you know even when i move back to india i realize that this is a very transitional time and that excitement is still very there very much there but as as there are endless challenges so i'll i'll okay. be open to anything you want to know Yes. Um, th so th thank thank you Saika so much for that uh introduction um it's really fascinating uh some of us know a lot about the education Indian educational system some don't know anything at all so that was incredibly helpful um and there's there's a it, it was so rich I really appreciate it that I you know I I wrote down like 18 different questions so we'll we'll sort of we'll talk a bit and If people also want to start putting questions into the chat, I can see how I can kind of weave those into the conversation as well. Um, Saika, you'll you'll be you'll be thrilled to hear, I'm sure, that the CSU system is actually one of the most affordable systems. Our tuition, uh, I believe, right now is about five and a half thousand dollars for an entire year. Um, so you know, again, in an Indian context, that would still be a fair chunk of money for a lot of our. you know students it is as well but it's still a very cheap uh uh you know education for the US um and that brings up one one topic that I'm curious about one of the things right you talked about um the the birth rate as one of the issues in sort of who gets into universities 
The, the other issue that's big in California and in the US is giving access to university to a more diverse group of students, right? And in America, that's frequently defined along racial and ethnic lines and maybe disability as well, and to some extent, economic class. I imagine in India, there are similar sort of discussions about what sort of groups of the population get into university. Um, I know in, in some ways there are quotas, because you, can you talk a bit about sort of how diversity works within edu Indian education and then also at Ashoka specifically? Yes, absolutely. Excellent question. I first, I should say that I feel really excited that this is happening at CSU. Uh, and CSU Long Beach, because um, I think I was just talking about you, what you guys are doing in terms of te training teachers. That's really exciting because I, in my time in the US, I, um, I was mostly, um, you know, obviously you did grad school and also taught at research universities, which is a very different system. And it sort of makes you think of a landscape almost in exclusion. But I think what, what you are doing here is actually really exciting and has an urgency, which I think will transcend this whole crisis narrative in education and especially in the humanities. I, I think that's completely not relevant. So I'm really excited to be here and that you have a really strong education school. Um, of course, the Cal State, I mean, I, 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 I was in the Bay Area and I know in the UCs also, there's a, there's a bit of a, a concern, but just not, Cal States are definitely much more. Uh, in India, you are absolutely right, Norbert. This is a staggering. This is a staggering situation. This is a really staggering situation, and I think uh, I have to say that when you have this interdisciplinary liberal arts university set up by private investors, it you know model very much on. I think Ashoka's model is very much an university like Princeton. Um, so a strong undergraduate division and a very strong research division. No professional school. So one of the key division is that it's no professional school. So it's, so it's not like Harvard or Stanford, which has a law school or, you know, or a business school or a medical school. Ashoka plans never to have a professional school. It will only focus on this, which makes it a lot like Princeton. Um, and yes, it is invariably an elite system, an elite model, um, you know, part of what has drawn faculty from all over the world and students increasingly also from outside India are coming in. Um, and uh, Ashoka has a lot of a strict significant financial aid system. Um, you know, uh, so they uh, have what uh, essentially need blind aid. But what I also saw, I mean, so before I came to Ashoka, I, I, I taught at Stanford for several years. And what I saw there was that 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 only solves part of the problem, you know, you can, you can, so you are there, but then when you go out with your friends, see the kind of money you have, you know, whether, you know, you, in, during spring break, you know, where do you go, you go to the south of France, or so those problems are very much here too, that you clearly have a social class, you know, whether you come, I mean, I've written on this quite a bit, I've been examining this year of caste uh, in a series of articles recently that how, uh, and, and those of you who follow would know that there have been a lot of caste related um, violence, even suicides. Um, because um, India obviously had what is a Indian equivalent of affirmative action, the reservation system for, um, you know, for people from caste and franchise groups. And that has led to a lot of backlash from the sort of caste privileged people. They feel like, oh, everything is reserved. You know, we have no chance if I'm an upper caste. So there's been a lot of, um, but of course, you know, as it often happens, people from a privileged background don't often see the invisible privilege they have been enjoying for generations. And why somebody from a different background just to get a level playing field should so that the same kind of I'm sure you had the same kind of debates in, in America. Yeah. Um, so this has been a huge uh, problem. And sometimes when I go, I mean, it's one thing to sit in Delhi and teach in a university like this, but when, when I sometimes go to a remote rural university and i have to say that this is where the socialist system we may complain about it we may say it's exam driven it's boring it's dodgy but it's affordable it is mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. people yeah. can actually go and i am always impressed by really dedicated teachers who are doing the best they're mm -hmm. trying there, there are no resources there are no libraries but the, i'm always moved by um that um that dedication i'm i'm worried about the government's attitude 
I don't think this government has been very supportive of either caste reservation or any of these things. Mm. Um, but I think this is a big challenge. And I think mm. one thing I've been a huge, huge champion of is to democratize the admission system. Yeah. Because yeah. as you already know that it's very easy to create an admission system which already privileges exactly. kind of, you know, obviously yeah. similar debates with standardized tests, SATs, whether it or oh, the suburban white kids are, you know, mm-hmm. that, that kind of education. So we have the same situation here that you know we uh, can have an admission system which privileges people who speak English in a certain way, people who, mm-hmm. you know, um, so how do we, even in the English literature uh, classrooms, it's quite fascinating that we have students whose English is actually fairly weak, but they bring vernacular models of wisdom. They bring, you know, knowledge of local literatures, which are really fascinating. And I think the challenges, and this particularly works when we are reading, recruiting students for the PhD programs, you know, PhD mm-hmm. um, is a particular challenge because I think, as I said, the culture is that the best students often leave for overseas after the bachelor's or the master's. But we are getting some rural students, some even caste, caste oppressed students who are certainly not trained in the kind of discourse we privilege in a Western style yeah. academia, but they bring local knowledges, they bring certain provincial um, you know, wisdoms. And I think it's really up to the advisor to integrate that into the kind of discourse that is academically accepted. Yeah. So yes, this is very much a concern all the way from first year college to the PhD. We are not very much involved in the college admissions because that is handled by the admissions team. But mm-hmm. I know they're constantly trying to work on that and the diversity yeah. is, I mean, in English in India tends to be an elite subject. So we mm-hmm. probably will get there last, but I know in economics and the sciences, they're already starting to see some diversity, but a lot of work has to be done. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that sounds like we're working on on very sort of similar things, um, maybe with different categories. Um, and I was I was very interested in in one of the first things you said about the professional schools. Um, and I see there was a question about STEM versus humanities. So I want to get to that via a different step first, um, which you write about in in college a lot, which is one of the tensions. Um, that sort of also informs the way universities work is the the tension between job preparation and education in sort of the wider sense, right? So are we training our students for a particular profession? You know, this is the person who is going to be the engineer or the doctor or the lawyer or whatever. And you said you guys don't and won't have professional schools. Um, so how, how does that tension work out between trying to give students a, a general education with a small g and a small e versus preparing them for the job market? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And I've spoken to some of the founders directly about this. And again, as I said, the founder who I was talking to was actually an engineer by training. He had a PhD in engineering from Penn. And he was sort of he was uh, part of the team that set up the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. Mm-hmm. And he was of the opinion that uh, most people really, what they do in their, in their lives, a very little relationship to what they study in college. Mm-hmm. You know, except for a few hardcore professional fields like law and medicine, even engineers really don't practice engineering, you know, after five years of getting, they basically get into management and administration. And his point was very much, I mean, he was sort of in favor of even abolishing the MBA because he feels like you can't learn business from textbooks. You need to, <laughs> you need to start, start. That's fundamentally- pretty radical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah he's, a, he's a business school uh, dean, but he was like, no, I, I, I think it's going to be all dated. We need to, and, and actually at Ashoka, we have something called the Young India Fellow, which is a one year crash course. Uh, postgraduate crash course in the liberal arts. So these are people, mm-hmm. most of them are from engineering and business backgrounds. They haven't been exposed to a range of disciplines, but they come to Ashoka for one year and they take shorter modules, not full courses, but maybe six to 10 week courses in economics, in literature, in philosophy, in you know things like leadership. It's what I call a liberal arts MBA, but with much more. And the whole idea was that, um, I, I know, and I'm from, quoting Pramath Raj Sinha here, Pramath, Pramath's argument was that, you know, you engage with the fundamental disciplines, whether it's economics 
or literature or philosophy or mathematics or sciences, the rest you pick up on the job. So that was his argument. And I'm certainly not knowledgeable enough in the world of business to sort of back it up or question it. But I think the sense is that, um, you know, I think even in India, we are seeing a lot of students who are in their th uh, 30s or even 40s, they want to change of career. And they feel that, you know, they have no skills to fall back on. So there's a lot of debate about what, what is the best use one can do of this three or four years of a life. And I think there's an increasing, I know, people who are say, saying that, you know, the education we are giving them is too narrow. You know, mm -hmm. even if you want to, whether you want to study literature or physics, you need to have a broader range of skills so that you can fall back on something. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, you know, and then, of course, there's a more practical thing about, you know, um, not just what you study, but the quality of education overall you mm -hmm. get and the kind of peer networks you form. So I think, you know, again, I think it's true that because this university has emerging as a fairly mm -hmm. elite one within India, I think um, the peer networks they will take along and they will form. I mean, in reality, the students are the kind who will probably go for some kind of mm -hmm. for the study after this. Yeah. But um, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I finished my college in the last years of the last uh, century in the late 90s, but even in the 21st century, um, the digitized economy is quite quite fascinating. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many students who are getting, I mean, even the world of online um, media venture alone has absorbed so many of our students. A good number of students are still headed to graduate school in the disciplines, mm -hmm. but many of them are not. So yeah. I think it's, a, it's kind of an, uh, it's kind of a, Kind of ongoing thing. I mean, part of the reason why they say the IITs were very successful was not necessarily because they were doing engineering, but they were getting the best students mm. in culture. I mean, even in the 80s, mm. 70s and 80s, apparently the best students went for a more humanistic kind of education in colleges like St. Stephen's in Delhi or residency in Calcutta. But then the focus shifted to the IITs. And the big reason behind the success of the IITs is not that they're studying engineering, but they're simply drawing the best students. And then is many um, yes. So, um, sorry. So then, in, in, you know, in terms of a university like Ashoka, is that a marketing challenge to sort of get out to the students or the potential students and their parents, presumably, that, hey, here's this new thing we're doing, here's why we're doing it, so that you can attract those best students as well? I think for some parts of the middle class, it's a fairly easy sell. So these are people who don't have a middle and upper middle class, you know, or the wealthier classes. It's a fairly easy sell because these are families where there's no immediate anxiety that you must get a job right away. And they are rather looking for options to experiment with their education. And, and as I said, even and it's across, you know, um, across the board, um, it's still fairly affordable. So it's not like you're going to graduate with a degree in English or economics with a huge loan. Yeah. Um, but at the, at the same time, it is true, the whole obsession with engineering and technocratic education is fairly deep in India. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of parents for whom, you know, the kind of holy grail is clearing the medical or the engineering entrance test. Yeah. Um, and for them, of course, it, uh, it is confusing. And even when they come to Ashoka, they would much rather study something like economics, which they feel is viable. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think once people understand what we're trying to do here, that you really come here without declaring a major, you spend your entire first year and part of the second year actually uh, not doing any major. So you, mm -hmm. so the whole idea is that the kind of um, general education courses, you know, whether from philosophy to, and these are courses that which are not owned by any discipline. These are kind of yeah. modes of inquiry. So, mm -hmm. you know, something mm -hmm. like, uh, principle of science might be offered by biology or psychology or physics something like great books is offered by history or philosophy or literature often together so the idea is that they're not department owned courses but more mm -hmm. thinking which sort of expose you to different epistemological ways of looking yeah. at the world mm -hmm. so this is actually very new and once they are in these classrooms they their their sense mm -hmm. of oh what do you want to do gets really shifted around yeah. and that i think is the strongest but also the most confusing part like what is yeah. that <laughs> even for human humanity students they're like i don't want to do math i, I don't want yeah. to do science 
It's just the way there are those science students saying, I don't want to study books, so, but we want to throw, throw mm. all of them together in this great cauldron. And yeah. you know, as you read my book, I always think that the most yes. exciting students yes. are the ones who can do both. Yes. And really yes. use the so-called left and right brain together. And we do sure. have some, some of my best students are actually English majors, mm -hmm. dual majors from English and math, and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. That's great, I, yeah. Creative writing students are economics majors, psychology majors, so they actually really, that is happening, not in a yeah. huge way. Yeah. And that sort of this sort of leads uh, directly into a question that uh, Zakaria had asked uh, in the chat. Are you out there, Zakaria? Do you want? Can you ask that out loud? You can unmute yourself. Oh yes, I'm here. Go ahead. So I'm from Oman, and it's also a country with a very socialized um, education, and uh, the education is very centrally planned. So the government sees where the jobs are needed, and those are the fields where um, the scholarships for education are provided. And I feel like a huge part of our uh, perception of the how STEM and humanities are seen in the country are based upon how the government is treating those fields. So I'm wondering how that translates in India. Right, right. No, that's a great question. I mean, as, again, those of you who know something about the Indian scene know that right after independence, the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru uh, really, he was big on scientific education, scientific and technological education. So he set up a lot of, uh, both in a research way as well as in a professional way. So he set up a lot of research centers um, and the whole idea that a newly decolonized nation needs new bridges and urban planning and everything and factories. So the IITs were very much formed with that in mind, but the IITs also took significant inspiration from institutions like MIT. So the IITs actually have very robust humanities and social science curriculum also. The IITs are, for those of you who don't know, it's Indian Institute of Technology. They are engineering institutes, but they actually have supporting humanities curriculum. And we actually have some of our best humanities faculty are from the IITs. So an IIT student is actually quite well-rounded. They are very strong, um, but um, but the government, I think, um, I think in the if the new education policy, there is a lot of thrust towards, you know, kind of interdisciplinary liberal arts education. So that there's a lot of talk about it. And since I was I was consulted a little bit on this um, by some committee members, I know there's genuine excitement around it. And there are people like Manjul Bhargav, the mathematician at Princeton, who was on the committee who's also acknowledged his the influence of Indian classical music on his mathematical training. So there's this, that interest. The biggest worry is that whether the government is ready to honor the liberal part of liberal arts, whether obviously when we talk about a liberal education, we don't just mean somebody who can do math and English and a kind of a, a skill in a sterile way, but somebody who can think fearlessly, question the state, um, you know, um, raise questions about privilege. Um, that is what I think is a worry for many of us who um, have, might have in many ways moved away from the socialist colonial model, but still see its great virtue in its commitment to a large section of the population, including our sort of less privileged ones. So that is the worry whether they're truly open to, you know, especially if you followed some of the protest movements that have erupted in institutions like the Jawaharlal Nehru University and the government has been pretty brutal in its oppression. Um, so that is the part that is worrisome. I think the government does, from my interaction with the NAP committee, my sense is they do want a more liberal education, but some of us think that that might also be a way of smuggling in a certain narrative about India a certain mm. image about India as a Hindu India. So when I, I actually had this conversation with a committee member that he was asking me, why is your approach to liberal arts so Western inflected? And, and I did say there's something called Kala. You know, Kala is the Sanskrit word for the arts, though it's a very exhaustive word. And then I see, it, you know, in the document, this has a lot of Panini and the Sanskrit, but there's a complete no mention of say, the Islamic heritage or even the you know other influences. India is a very diverse country. So the worry is that, yes, they, there is an interest in truly interdisciplinary liberal arts, but liberal in its true expanse as free thought. Um, that is something I think we are much more skeptical about. But I think there is a small shift. It's still a very small one, sort of this beginning that this, this new thing is happening. And there's something about engineering colleges, not the IITs, but the second and the third grade. There was a time when 
every apartment complex had an engineering college because it was so profitable and they especially in south india but now those seats are going sort of unoccupied people have realized that you know you're not getting jobs because the education you're getting there is so subpar so that is the beginning of the move towards um and I, i think india is still a very much a stem country there's no question yeah. about that it will take years to change but there's a small sort of flow of change in the different direction even if this flow is now limited towards the more privileged sections of the population yeah. and you you also wrote i think in a recent outlook column that there's the 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 counter flow that at the um high school level of emer or the equivalent right that actually what's being taken out of the curriculum because of covid is actually things like historical reflection courses on democracy that kind of thing so i think it's yeah. you know as everywhere it's always a, a back and forth of different yes yes yeah. at the excuse of abridging the curriculum they've taken everything about secularism democracy mm. and you know we get um, disturbing news all the time that one mm. is that um oh the the madrasas the muslim mm. the community and they have been told that they need to sort of um include the hindu epics because mm. that apparently the indian civilization and that is you know again extremely concerning that you basically an equation equation of india with hinduism and i'm yeah. about yeah. to write something about this myself okay. <laughs> well i look forward to reading that um there there was another question um that sort of uh, was also related to stem and the humanities uh, just fund are you out there do you want to ask your question yes uh thank you very much for allowing me an opportunity uh my name is uh, uh dr mori i am from southern california los angeles area and uh, i've been involved into some disciplines of a humanity uh for last several years and i think one of the co- one of the issues that i am facing or i have seen students facing is those who graduate from the humanities course they are not able to find a job market and because of that they leave those discipline and go and do some other career moves so uh compared to the stem classes and so on and so forth so i i want to see at the academic level is there any uh, uh any way to address this particular disparity thank you very much yeah no thank you that's a great question that's really important i mean of course this is um a concern i think in india it's a little different because you know for instance something like english has a huge purchase in the universities and also in the job market because of the obvious party the colonial factors and what being communicative in english can get can get you it open many different doors and i've seen very brilliant stem students not do so well simply because their english was patchy so it's a little different but i think what i keep telling the st- today students is that you know you're fine you're majoring in english but if you were good in maths keep that alive you know by all means you know, and we have some of the as i said the most exciting students are sort of doing both english and math or if you you know go and take and this is something i do say in my book that what i call the counterdisciplinary that if you have interest in disparate directions by all means keep it alive you know if you really don't have a quantitative mindset then try to take at least a social scientific discipline which sort of makes you think differently if not economics take sociology sociology will still sort of in sort of introduce you to a human archive but it uses graphs and maps and it has a more quantitative approach so i think in some ways to diversify i think the idea of the liberal arts model that we are practicing is that not to produce humanity students who are just narrowly focused on the humanities just the way not to produce science students who are just too narrowly focused on sciences so some measure of range is actually what is really ready and i think the fault of the existing system in india is not whether it's humanities or science but because it's too obsessed with one direction and i think you know i go to high schools all the time i give talks and i meet all the students who tell me oh you know i um i want to study um um medicine but i love sports i want to um, um study um you know science but i love um, music and you know i have an education system where i asked to choose i have to give up one but i think the idea is to create an education system where you don't have to give up you can actually have 
you know, some measure of expertise in both. So I think in many ways, if we encourage them, then it is certainly possible. But um, I think, you know, I think um, it's still, it's, there's no point pretending that, you know, a, a philosophy student will have the same opportunity as somebody who has a degree in engineering. That's not going to happen. But I think the idea is to create engineering students who are more attuned to the humanistic and the social so that we have a more ethical balanced and communicative workplace and that larger ecosystem will in turn create jobs like one of the things of the young india fellows in ashoka is that many of them rather than entering the corporate workplace they are trying to do startups they're trying to get look at seed funding and a lot of the things they do is what they call social entrepreneurship you know things which are not necessarily about profiteering, but some kind of social, whether working in a village. And I think the hope is that they're going to create an ecosystem which will absorb people with sort of alternative forms of career. But, you know, that will take time. But I am definitely, you know, see a lot of excitement around the humanities, mm. in, not only in India, but Singapore, Korea, China, and all of these places, I think there's a lot of um, possibilities in, of the humanities if they're studied in a kind of interdisciplinary way and with the innovative pedagogic framework, not in the kind of colonial bureaucratic way that was given to us in a very passive way for the last 200 years. So would you, Saika, would you advocate then that all students at say Cal State Long Beach or Ashoka should be double majors and double majors even more specifically um, in what you call the contradisciplinary model rather than sort of, you know, just the interdisciplinary. One of my favorite lines in your entire book was integration, I think, frankly, is a bit overrated. I love that, that line in your book, right? So it's not interdisciplinary in the sense that things have to yeah. work together, but specifically this yeah. contrast. So what, would you say that all students should have that? I think that's the that's a kind of a utopian goal that would be the best thing but i also recognize uh, it's also extremely hard uh, as a team that i think only a small minority of students would be able to actually handle both literature and computer science or physics and philosophy which are like the time honored combinations and that is i think in many ways the crux of my book the idea of the contradisciplinary that you know you, you don't give up that uh, and what I say is that, you know, this can be staggered. So the, probably the only, the most intellectually adventurous student can do math and English. If you're not so intellectually ad adventurous, you know, how about you do economics? Now, there's a kind of a gradient there. You're still using scientific and mathematical methods, but your archive is now human. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of students come thinking I'm going to study economics, thinking I'm going to talk about wealth and inequality and all that. And then they realize they're doing nothing but math. So in a way, there's already a kind of a mathematical, I say, even if that's too mathematical for you, look at sociology. Mm -hmm. Sociology and anthropology are very similar disciplines. You know, their archive is very similar, but their methodology is very different. You know, sociology often will take a much more mathematical and quantitative approach to the same kind of archive that. So I am, I always advise students to branch as far out as possible. You may not be able to, I think at the ultimate spectrum is the student who can actually handle a double major, but obviously not all students can do that. But I think next to that would be maybe a student who can do a major and a minor and different still. And if you can't major and minor, at least take classes outside your comfort zone, which will again, you know, sort of loop back to taking the range part of general education very seriously. But I think we all know that gen ed classes are classes people just want to take out, get them out of, it's kind of required classes are never fun. So in a way, the true challenge of this range would be realized in the principle of contradisciplinarity mm -hmm. when actually they do something. And as I said, this can be realized across the whole gradient. I don't think yeah. everybody can handle, you know, I mean, I wish I knew more math. I have a terrible head for it, but, <laughs> but I think we can, open students up in many different yeah. ways and there's a way of talking about the philosophy of science or the history of science you know or think something like digital humanities which i think is huge in in literary studies now which again sort of goes in the other direction so there are many ways of pushing students outside their comfort zone and obviously in the book i talk about how even a certain basic sociological understanding of the individual artistic inspiration as obviously the enlightenment you know to period you work on you know is the idea of the author figure as 
drawn out. So there are many ways we have we need to kind of push that comfort out, and I think that can only lead to a good result. Yeah. Okay, and I mean the, the general education thing that's that's really interesting in the U.S. right now because there's again there's sort of a tug of war between the people who think of general education as exposing you to new and different things. And then there's the people who want general education to sort of tie into the things that the student is already interested in, right? And so that um, that tug of war seems to me sort of between interdisciplinary and and contradisciplinary to some extent. Uh, exactly. and, yeah. Yeah. You have the core model and the bucket model, and mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know something like the general education requirement will have to be revamped every few years. And yeah. even took up, mm -hmm. you had a lot of debate about this we started mm -hmm. with nine foundation courses and that felt to be too much because mm -hmm. we didn't have the our BA had to be completed in three years now i think we are moving more towards the four-year model so there was a mm -hmm. space crunch so then for a year we moved to what they call the bucket model you need to mm -hmm. take two humanities courses two social sciences courses two natural sciences courses but then we move back again because that again feels like not the right mm -hmm. that doesn't mm -hmm. give the right breadth and the real USP of this Ashoka education mm -hmm. is actually this liberal arts range. We do yeah. have strong departments and very strong research foundation and disciplines, but the real distinguishing factor is that we, everybody here has to study everything. And a yeah. lot of revolutionary changes happens in these classes. You know, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm just hugely ex a fan of how many psychology and economics majors we win over to English just from our <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. And honestly, in English, you have a very low bar because they've only mugged up names of poets and till yeah. CBAC. Once they come to our classroom, like, oh, English can be not like that. We are actually asked what we think that's important. That's, I mean, so, you know, so that's. Yeah. <laughs> That happens quite a bit. So it's actually That's a lot great. of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, there, there's a question uh, from the chat. Um, how does, how would, or how do you think religious studies figures into the humanities? Right. I think that's a, um enormously important question. I mean, I'm not in the field of religious studies. I've written a bit about religion here and there. Um, um, I think religious studies is a important discipline right now all over the world, given the kind of role religion is playing in political developments, the kind of, um, I mean, certainly in my, in my, one of my gateway courses, Forms of Literature, I talk about religion and literature as kind of parallel course, parallel experiences that how, you know, obviously something like um, literary criticism owes its origin to hermeneutic practices, going back to in the Bible or you know, the Quran or the Jewish texts and how, you know, so there is that whole importance, you know, I think on the whole, um, I think it's uh, really important. I mean, certainly from the Indian perspective, the biggest debates that are being fought in the public sphere are about religion. I was just talking about the whole question of introducing Indian epics in the Muslim madrasas. Um, and um, I think that's a very important um, that, that, that can be a really important part. I mean, I think there are so many ways. I don't think we necessarily have to have separate courses in religious studies as such, but something like great books would obviously have the great religious texts, you know, whether it's the Gita, the Bible, you know, the Quran. And I know many of our colleagues who teach those courses actually have those texts or the Mahabharata, you know, as part of those texts. So definitely, mm -hmm. and uh, debates around these, um, these texts are, very much essential mm -hmm. because you know we are in a space where people are intolerant of debate so I, mm -hmm. I definitely think it's a very important discipline both from a content perspective as well as from a methodological perspective because close study of languages and culture really would not come without its precedent mm -hmm. in religious mm -hmm. opinion so yeah. on both it's very important. Yeah. of course if you're if you're assigning the the bible and the quran and the mabaratha um, you're signing a lot of reading, so <laughs> those are all very, very long books. So um. yeah, so not the not the whole, but the juicy parts. They they have a lot of <laughs> okay. So the juicy yeah. parts can be quite quite scandalous. Yeah, yeah. we got uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, you know, uh, a couple of weeks back, and I we did book one and book nine, and what mm -hmm. my assignment yeah. was. Okay, so you imagine there's a new edition of the Bible coming out and somebody has proposed including book one and book nine of Paradise Lost into the new edition, mm -hmm. you know, so write 
you know, kind of a response supporting or sub negating the decision. Would you agree? That <laughs> that's <should> also yeah. <laughs> be, along with <laughs> That's a that's a fantastic assignment. I, I may I may steal that if I may. Um, I'm gonna I'm just gonna ask one uh, final question, and then well then we can wrap it up. Um, we know you you have to recover from getting up early, um, and this is sort of building on a lot of stuff that we've talked about, and then the the religion issue in particular. Um, what's your experience, recommendation, thoughts about universities? avoiding social and political pressures, right? We, we both, you know, both our system and your system are in, you know, very troubling political times. Um, there's, there's social forces out there that, you know, some of us clearly embrace and some of us are not happy about. How, how does a university in practical terms sort of stay out of that or, or should they not stay out of that? Well, that's a great question, but a really big one. So I, I, I think I can pull justice to it. It's very, very important question, obviously. I mean, I think obviously there are certain social forces I don't think the university should resist, um, you know, because the universities are, I think this is very interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Andre Bete's work um, about universities in India in the 19th century, that he was very critical of the universities, um, that, oh, they are nothing but examination machines. And yet he says that, these they st they still serve important functions. These were some of the places where secular, independent thought, certain mm -hmm. of the reform movements were actually launched. And I, I talk about this in the opening chapter of the book that um, universities uh, in India were always at the vanguard, whereas you know as opposed to universities in Europe, which were very ancient, because universities were a modern thing in India. They were always ahead of their times in terms of women's education, in terms of you know, social progress. So in some ways, I think universities should have a symbiotic relationship with social pressure because it obviously reflects, you know, the whole question of reservation or, you know, um, caste. Um, that's been very thorny, like, you know, like um, clearly uh, some of the IITs and, you know, and, and that, that's why the engineering disciplines are very interesting because they, because they offer more immediate options of mobility, they often draw more students from the disadvantaged backgrounds than the humanities, which are seen as not offering immediate mobility. So I think in many ways, there needs to be an understanding of what it, it's going through. At the same time, the whole social inertia that we never change this colonial model, you know, that also needs to be overcome. So I think one needs to obviously take one what one can and reject what one needs to. The question of political pressure is more, I think I have great, greater clarity on that because obviously if the political pressure is one that is coming from the government, um, I still think the university, I mean, I think of the university as part of the Habermasian public sphere, you know, Habermas obviously talks about the whole sort of the literary sphere, but the university is also very much part of that sphere, which should be a space of vigilance. And, um, and I think obviously this is, I mean, you had four years of very, very, <laughs> you know, difficult political role, and I think that government's dispensation towards universities have been, you know, we it's been very clear, and hopefully things are, you know, improving now, and we still have that situation here in India, mm -hmm. and um, it's um, it's a lot trickier because I think the university system in India is much more dependent on the state, you know, in private universities are much more of a rarity. I think that way, I think the American system is unique in the whole world. Most worlds, most countries, university systems are nation driven and which is again, a good thing. I mean, public education is what educates a nation, but US does have some remarkable private institutions, which obviously can sort of retain a certain amount of autonomy against direct governmental intervention because of their endowments or funds or whatever. So I think that is the place. I mean, and that is the precarity that whether one can resist government pressure, especially given the kind of political trajectory a lot of the governments are showing worldwide. So it's a very important question, but a difficult one. All right. Um... That was actually a, a surprisingly fast answer to a very complex question. So that means we have time for one more question. Uh, Dr. Cooper wanted to ask a question. 
Yeah, uh, Seket, uh, so two things. One is uh, this was really nice to learn about the fact that you can incorporate uh, local vernacular knowledges. That was really um, thrilling to hear. But the main thing I wanted to ask is, why not take the Ashoka model in a diluted way and uh, somehow sell it to uh, on a wider basis, uh, like a foundation course? Did you say it had been tried and it failed or did, is, were you referring to something else? So that, for example, if you were to take uh, Bombay University, Calcutta University and have something of uh, the Ashoka model thrown in, uh, calling it foundation courses, there was some talk of this in the 1980s, and I have no clue because I came here at that time and I don't know what happened. But Romila Thapar was the one that kind of uh, started this idea of uh, learning politics, economics. You know, there was a whole uh, three philosophy, politics, economics kind of uh, mm -hmm. system in all, it was mandatory all across. So I'm just curious as to why not try and sell that model, but at a very diluted level to different colleges. It should give seed to something. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. That's a great point. I mean, I think we should, I mean, see the, what we call the Ashoka model, uh, there are two ways of looking at it. One is it will remain a limited model only to serve a very small section, maybe an influential section of the country's population, but a small section, or as Praveena uh, suggests that it can trickle down um, in different variations. Uh, and I certainly hope the latter will happen. And you're absolutely right. It's not that the Indian universities, the colonial universities have shut themselves off completely to this model. We, even when we went to college in, in the late 90s, we had what we call the past subjects, which are the subsidiary subjects. So you take, I mean, I studied English and there was sociology and political science. Um, but um, I think the main problem is actually one of pedagogy. See, any subject is only as good as the way it's taught. And um, what I've noticed is, and having you know spent time in the US and teaching here, going to grad school here, is that there's an amount of thought that goes into pedagogy. And I'm sure at Cal State here, you're right in the forefront of it because you're working with teachers so much. There's this amazing amount of thought and care that goes into thinking of pedagogy. I find that largely menacing in India. And in India, in this matter, it's like every every other matter. There's a lot of talent. There's a lot of a lot of human talent, but there's no system which kind of harnesses that talent into into anything. It's a it's a bit like you know, kind of like Indian classical music. You know, there's great talent, but unless you're part of a gharana, you and marry into a family, <laughs> there's this whole sense of you know. And I think since we are standardizing, we are kind of creating a creative writing department in India for the first time. We are dealing with that question. Um, so yeah, I think the pedagogy, I mean, I think the problem is you need teachers who can bring it to life mm -hmm. and you need to impress upon students that this is not something you just sort of get past. This is actually the key part. This is actually the key part. So, you know, I think the moment you take somebody in, in the first year saying, oh, you're going to be an economics major. And then you also study these things. Their mind is already made up. So we try to tell them you're not going to be a major at all. You're just going to be a student. And then I think there are all kinds of consideration. One is of course, and this is where the national education policy is interesting that they've actually recommended a possible four year degree because obviously adding a fourth year is essential to create this space. And yet in a country like India, four year means another year of waiting how many students can afford it how many students can stay away from getting a job right away so the, all these questions open up but i certainly agree in a sense with what you're saying that some sort of a breadth without that um it's really not possible you know and i think you know one can because again when i go to high schools and see i see students are really interested in different things Suddenly, at that point of entering college, we are just told to make a choice and give up everything else. And the idea is to obviously have a college system where they don't have to really do that. So I completely agree. I mean, the, I think you mentioned the PP track, politics, philosophy and economics, which is the old Oxford model, the Oxford, um, you know, kind of um, 
imperial service model, the, all the, you know, Eton, Harrow, Manchester, and then Oxbridge, they study so that they can rule. And, and Ashok actually also has a PPE, which is, they find kind of interesting and quaint also, but obviously very exciting. Um, so I think that is definitely possible, but I think we do need to really start with the research culture and uh, the research culture needs to be pushed back because no matter what you study, if it's all going to be mucked up, regurgitated for an exam, it's not going to stay. So the freedom needs to be given, there needs to be pedagogic experiments. But in principle, I completely agree that there has to be ways of, you know, kind of um, Slowing spreading. the model, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think it can be done on different levels, yes. All right, well, I, um, I think we can all work on that together. Um, so thank you, Professor Majumdar, for this really interesting presentation. We learned a lot about the complementariness, but then also the similarities between the Indian and the English systems. We didn't hear, or the American system, we didn't hear very much, uh, sorry, about your creative writing, your novels. So maybe we'll have to have a separate event about that at some point. Um, but thank you so much. They are very much, I mean, they are Bildungs to write it to write a Bildungs Roman, or in my cases, what is called a stunted Bildungs Roman is actually to <laughs> support education in your walking life and in the dark life as a novelist, you show why education is disruptive and why you rebel against it. So, definitely, yes. you know. My, thank you, my thank you. That's, that's, that's and another. one of the weird things on Zoom is that we can't really applaud. So I'm just going to applaud and everybody else can do their, you know, or so thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and Tim, did you have any final word? You're good? Okay. Yeah. I want to thank Sakata for yeah. stay on. And I, I just had one little comment at the very end. I, as you were moving to a four-year university, which I thought was interesting, you know, the liberal arts in a four-year university is a sort of an American invention. And we are, in fact, moving in the other direction. We are figuring out, do we move our first year of high college into high school, or does the last year of high school move into college, the dual enrollment and everything else? So I thought that was a kind of interesting counterpoint. Oh, that's really interesting. You can chat about that. Learn more about that. Currently, what we have is we have the, because the UGC University Grants Commission recognizes a three-year degree, uh, we have a three-year degree and we have the fourth year is a kind of a postgraduate diploma, though in our minds, we definitely imagine the bachelor's as a four-year degree. So I think the national education policy has in now United made it for a four-year degree. Here is moving in the, uh, I'm not making a value judgment here, but it's, it's moving in the other direction. And it's partly driven, I think, by cost. And that goes back to your original point. So anyway, I really appreciate the talk. But if we could just stay on with Norbert, Praveen, and I. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thanks, everyone. And Vaishali, we can stop recording. Um, and